Okay, the time worm from Richard Short brings us into episode 71, part B of the of the LOTD pod, the Lap of the Dial podcast. I'm Flick, and along with me... This is uh, from sunny Oakland, California, Richard Short, the author and uh, singer of Time Worm. You can find that on my new album, With Clairvoyance. And composer and... <laughs> and uh, mixer and publicity. <laughs> <laughs> Lonely being DIY sometimes, but uh, A and R guy, yeah, suits me fine. Then. Yeah, my personality. Yep. So, what are we talking about um, on Part B of Revisionist History, Flick? Uh, so, Part B of Revisionist History, we're talking about their Satanic Majesty's request oh, by the Rolling Stones. I, I just happen to have it uh, on vinyl right here. <laughs> That's a good thing, then. So you'll. <laughs> You'll be able to uh, to talk about it then as we uh, as we go along. You got it. You got you, it. You'll be able to follow along. I will. I will. All right. So, uh, this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this, uh, you know, uh, as we talked about with uh, Neil Young's Trans, uh, probably a, a polarizing album. Maybe maybe not as much so now as it was in its day, uh, but definitely definitely one of those albums that. Uh, I don't think every Rolling Stone fan is on board with, uh, and I guess we'll as we'll go along, we'll we'll uh, figure out whether or not they should be. I think uh, uh, key for uh, you know any of you guys who are listening right now, uh, feel free any, to call any of the Rolling Stones that are listening. Yeah, because I know they feel pretty strongly about it, um, and I, I don't like to disagree with them, you know, especially. Uh, especially Woody and, and Mick, but uh, sometimes you gotta. Well, Woody wasn't on it, so I, I don't know if, if he's really an authority to speak on it. Well, he, he has opinions by osmosis. <laughs> so as a fan, maybe, maybe he has his opinions, but uh, it gets pretty yeah, thorny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so basically this was, I, you know, like I should have this at, at my fingertips here, but uh, this, this is coming off of between the buttons, right? This is after between the buttons and before beggars banquet. This is, uh, you know, 19 back in the day, you know, if you're the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, you didn't put out an album and then wait three years, like a lot of people do today, but like, like uh, the Rolling Stones do these days too. Well, they, they wait like 20 years. It's, it's fine. They've, they've earned it. <laughs> uh, so 1967 is uh, between the buttons, uh, which that, that's kind of like a compilation, isn't it? Uh, well, I, I guess you could call it that it's not really a compilation, but, but uh, um, it has it does have a couple of songs that were on i think the previous album but the, it's really because of the difference between the american versions and the uk versions so not really a compilation in, in any sort of conventional way uh so it's uh between the buttons and flowers is also from 1967 and then yeah and 68 is beggar's banquet let it bleed 69 uh get your yayas out 70 and sticky fingers 71 Okay. Yeah. So Flowers, I think, is maybe a compilation. So, like, the last major album before 67 is really Aftermath. Yeah. Well, I mean, Between the Buttons, I think, is. But yeah, at any rate, yeah, it's, it's, it's that, that sort of thing. The, the Aftermath, uh, you have your, um, you know, basically, you're you're coming from the 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 big singles. You know, like the more poppy Rolling Stones, but you know they're always they're always the into the blues, but but not really as authentic as they got with it later on. But yeah, after Matthew, you, ha you have your singles, your mother's little helper, you're under my thumb, paint it black. Yeah, uh, paint it black out uh, out of time. And, and that sort of thing. And uh, then between the buttons, you have uh, Ruby Tuesday. Uh, or, Well, Ruby Tuesday was, uh, I guess that was on Flowers. Um, uh, connection, she, she smiled sweetly. Uh, have you seen your mother, baby, standing in the shadows, and so on. And, you know, then, then a little thing called uh, Sergeant Pepper's happened to the world, and uh everybody was was 
was biting those rhymes and uh the rolling stones <laughs> you know can try to deny it but but i think it's pretty obvious that uh that they were trying to infringe on that territory a bit with this yeah and it's a it's a weird period of time because you have um some really dark cool uh stones classics coming out right before this but then you also have some other like really you know maybe not lyrically feel good but kind of feel good sounding tunes like like ruby tuesday and um and then yeah it's kind of hard to to think of this album without talking about sergeant peppers and and maybe not the i i think the rivalry with the beatles is kind of like a overblown or maybe even like apocryphal but definitely aware of each other and what they're doing and what what tunes they have coming out and, yeah i mean the, yeah. they uh so maybe the, maybe a response to sergeant pepper yeah i i think the rivalry is more of a media creation than anything else um there there's a song that uh didn't actually appear on satanic majesty's request uh, but but was recorded in those sessions that uh, I think both Paul and John are actually on singing background vocals. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like that, that. Yeah, definitely not a rival uh, in in the way that maybe people think. Um, uh, and it's uh, so it came out um, 1967. Uh, the big single on this was uh, was it? She's a rainbow, right? Yeah, so she's a rainbow in two thousand light years from home. Uh, yeah, I think she's a rainbow was the A side, and two thousand light years was the B side. Um, yeah, so the, you know this this uh, was an album that wasn't super well received. Like it, uh, you know, it was compared unfavorably to Sgt. Pepper's. Really, I, I think the Stones are t to blame for that. It, it didn't really have to be uh, something so easily comparable to that. Uh, but you know, if if you uh, if if it doesn't come across from the album cover alone, it'll it'll come across as as we go through the tracks. I'm sure. Yeah, well, uh, the album cover. So, um, the album composition is a completely trippy. Um, uh, portrait of the band, uh, also framed up, photographed, and art directed by Michael Cooper, who also did the cover of uh, Sgt. Pepper. Yeah, and it, it does have a similar feel. And um, there's, I don't know, there's some references. I don't, I don't quite remember what they are, but there are some references in the album cover to the Beatles. The way that. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's has a reference to the Rolling Stones on on its cover as well. Right. Yeah. So the I, the Beatles' heads are in these little flowers that are kind of in the foreground. So it's kind of hard to tell because uh, the uh, portrait is a kind of photograph called a lenticular. So you kind of a hologram kind of thing. Uh, so. It's not very clear if you have any of the original or the reissues that still have this. Um, but as you rotate the cover, all the members of the band turn their heads. And Mick, who's on the cover wearing this great, like, spooky wizard hat, opens his arms like he's either trying to hug you or grab you. <laughs> And in the foreground, uh, you have some some whatnot that, you know, I don't know if it's my my copy being an old '60s copy or whatever, but you can't really see it. And I don't know if I have messed up eyes or something, but the lenticular doesn't work for me unless I close one of my eyes. <laughs> oh, maybe maybe you need to see an optometrist. Uh, you know, I, I did, and they told me I, I have the same kind of vision as a jet fighter pilot. That would seem to be good. So maybe I need like worse vision to, to make this. Happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think a good metaphor for this record is on the inside cover, there's a maze. And if you read about 
the special meaning of the art, a lot of people mentioned that it's a maze that you can't solve. You know, so it's it's not always satisfying. This record, so it, it's a little bit lumpy and weird, and I think to get to the bottom of why it has such strong singles on it, like "She's a Rainbow" and two thousand Man" and uh, songs that maybe could have been a single, like "Citadel." You have to kind of think about what the what were, the Stones were going through in nineteen sixty seven, and this was the. Aside from being the summer of love and the summer of Sergeant Pepper, it was also, um, gosh, I used to get, know that guy's name from uh, rock and roll biographies, but there was one particular uh, policeman in Britain that was going around like busting everybody for like the smallest amount of pot. And mm. uh, just before they started recording this album, both uh, Mick and Keith got busted and spent, I guess, a lot of the rest of the year going in between court dates and all the song and dance you have to do to get around that stuff. Um, also in 1967, uh, the longtime manager of the Stones, Andrew Luke Oldham, leaves, which uh, according to a lot of guys in the band, they're pretty happy about. Um, and this is also the infamous trip to Morocco, <laughs> in which... Uh, uh, Anita Pallenberg becomes um, starts hanging out with Keith rather than hanging out with Brian Jones. Yeah, and was that the uh, the same trip where uh, they did the field recordings for the Master Musicians of Jujuku uh, mm, I, album? I do not know. Huh. Yeah, but yeah, it, you had the the love triangle there, um, Andrew uh, Oldham not only was the manager, but also the producer. So this is a self-produced album, uh, Satanic Majesty's Request. And that's how you end up getting a really cool track. Uh, do you want to talk about the Bill Wyman track? Uh, well, yeah, I want to kind of go through it uh, a bit in order. But but uh, but yeah, the, the other thing that I'll mention to give it a little bit more context. Uh, so the Satanic Majesty's Request, you know, kind of, kind of has obvious connotations to it, but, but it really is just a play on words. Um, you know, like there, there are some songs that maybe fit the the bill for for what the the title evokes, but, but it, it's a play on uh, their their Britannic Majesty's request, right? Uh, the which, language inside of a passport, right? Yeah, and and so. You know, the thing about it is, is, is I think the title maybe suggests something that wasn't really probably even something that they were going for, although I think they're probably fine with it, as it turns out. Uh, but yeah, I want to I want to start with track one, because the thing about the comparisons between Sergeant Peppers is I think it was, you know, these are self-inflicted wounds, really. Um, it starts out with the song Sing This All Together, uh, which you know, is, is, is almost what I would call a song about a song. Like it, it's a song that isn't there to be a song so much as it is to set the album up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they were very much, you know, like they very much felt like they had to do what Sergeant Peppers did where it had an intro song and an outro song to it. Um, you know, and, and I could really do without that. Um, you know, I, I guess it's not the worst possible, uh, song and it does serve the purpose but does the purpose really need to be served i guess would be my question about that song i i like this tune a lot um and uh to your point about the album title um one of the things that always appealed to me about the stones is is that they kind of like flirted with the same kind of creepy stuff as uh, yeah uh, like led zeppelin with alistair crowley and and all that kind of kind of thing so before reading about it just kind of being like a punny title, um, I always thought like, whoa, that's that's really interesting. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like I love the Rolling Stones. They're so dark. Um, but yeah, I think uh, so if you're a youngster like me, being like maybe even like a little bit, you know, like, like, ooh, this satanic stuff on the album title kind of creeps me out a little bit. 
even though I'm not like a, you know, church goer or anything. Um, <laughs> I think the contrast of having that and then having like this really hippy dippy song as the beginning is like kind of creepy. In a good yeah, way. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you, you can read the opening song a, a little bit in that way. And I, I guess we should set it up a, a bit like we set up the, the Neil uh, with our, um, you know, putting it, this into context as far as uh, how does this, um, you know, like what are your what are your favorite Stones albums or songs, you know, and that sort of thing. Like where, where are you coming from going into this? Uh, that's a really good question. So I think for me, my household wasn't as much of a Stones household, um, as like, a, a uncle Neil and Grateful Dead household. So I had to do a lot of the work with getting into the Stones on my own. Um, I think there was a tape of Beggar's Banquet floating around in my childhood. And then, uh, as I got a little bit older, um, I started going through my parents' records and my dad was into the stones and I'd visit him in the summers. So he had, um, he had sticky fingers for sure. He had beggars and, uh, maybe aftermath. Um, and he also had their satanic majesty's request. So what I would do is I would come out here in the summers to California and hang out with my dad and my stepmom. Stepmom was working for Bill Graham at the time, and my dad was, you know, um, kind of a interesting guy coming off of a short decade of uh, of being a, a bohemian sports writer. So he had, <laughs> they both had really interesting record collections. The short part of that, uh, and my dad passed away pretty recently. So I have uh, his copy of Satanic Majesties for my childhood in my hands i also got like all of his tom waits and frank zappa records but what i would do is i would come out here in the summers and then put them all on tapes and bring them back to iowa you know and listen to them and um so i remember seeing this in the collection and my dad pointing out the the cool cover and uh i think he recommended seeing the film give me shelter mm. to kind of give it some more creepy context and uh, so, yeah, I, I listened to this album and yeah, I was a little bit creeped out by it, <laughs> but in a really good way, you know, and I liked, um, I liked the singles and I've, I even thought kind of the junk tracks were really interesting. Yeah, I, so I, the albums I grew up with, uh, my brother had a copy of uh, High Tide and Cream Grass, which is, you know, a singles compilation of the early singles. And uh, had had get your yayas out, which was uh, uh, the Madison Square uh, Garden concert uh, from you know like the the Beggars Banquet uh, Let It Bleed era, and and I guess also up to Exile. Um, yeah, and so so then uh, you know like a lot of things you know once I really got into the Stones, I. I absorb a lot of things very quickly, like a sponge. And so I don't remember, uh, at, you know, like how many albums in I was when I got Satanic Majesty's request. My favorites, though, have always been Exile on Main Street and, oh, yeah. and Sticky Fingers. And I, I think really recently, like Sticky Fingers has really risen to the top where even as great as Exile is, like Sticky Fingers is just so amazing to me and you have um, vinyl right oh yeah yeah you have the, well, the vinyl I, with the real zipper yeah yeah of i have you do, actually a couple of copies of that yeah yeah exile is um i i feel like you know you know the stones growing up listening to the radio you've heard all the sing. i think that's my earliest stones memory is just like listening to oldies radio spending a ton of time alone as a kid. Um, but then getting to college and, and someone being like, Oh, you don't have a copy of exile <laughs> and, uh, spending, I think my, um, you know, when you're a college kid and you have like 20 bucks to your name and you spent 14 of them on an exile on main street CD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's the kind of guy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that, that yeah. Be, we're, I uh, think we're both, we're yeah. both. 
so yeah, I picked that up from a uh, record collector. I think my maybe my first or second day in college in Iowa City, Iowa. Yeah, and yeah, I, I really you know like yeah the same same sort of thing. Any 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 money I had went to buying CDs, um, and so I, you know like. It didn't take me probably too long to get really deep into the Stones catalog. So, at the point, you know, like I didn't, I didn't make Satanic Majesty's request any any sort of priority or anything. Like I wasn't expecting anything too good, but I I liked it immediately. You know, like I, I guess I don't want to <laughs> give too much away uh, before we talk about the album. But but uh, yeah, like I I totally expected it to be a bad album from things I had heard. Uh, but didn't find that to be the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we've already kind of we've already talked about the first track, and yeah, I think right off the bat, you know, that it forfeits any any argument that uh, they weren't trying to do their own Sergeant Pepper's here. I think they were. Yeah. I mean, the sense I have is that. They were like, guys, let's do our Sgt. Peppers, and then they ran out of time. Right, yeah, they they probably didn't put in... Well, I, I think it's apparent in, in what we get to that they didn't put in either the time and or effort to, to uh, make a Sgt. Peppers, but that's, that is what they seemingly set out to do. Uh, track 2, Citadel, though. Um, <laughs> really good, like... Uh, it's a rockin' tune. Rockin' tune. Rockin' tune. Uh, really cool chord progression. Uh, uh, Just like it, the, the quality of that chiming uh, guitar riff. Yeah. Um, and I don't, the only other song that I feel really has that is that tune, um, Sunspots by Julian Cope. Yeah. It, it, uh, it you know, we, we talked a lot about toothiness and, and, uh, or I talked a bit about toothiness in the trans uh, look back at trans and, and definitely a lot of toothiness to Citadel really strong. Yeah. And I, I think lyrically it's really cool too. Um, you know, um, just instead of some guy on a rock record being like, uh, girl, I saw you, uh, I was buying cigarettes. It's no, it's not like that at all. It's like, Come meet me in the citadel. <laughs> Whoa, that that has some mystery to it. And when it's all wrapped up in like this really cool three chord sixties rock tune, it's it's gold. Yeah, and that that is one of those things I you know, I think we'll talk about this throughout the album that uh they were exploring a lot of interesting themes lyrically, uh, you know, a lot of ideas interesting lyrically. You know, for for a band uh, that you know, you know, like I, I it, it, there there is a mysticism to this album. There is a lot of that that sort of feel, a lot of lot of that feel that that the album title would you know maybe maybe uh, uh, connote. But but uh, yeah, I, th I think you feel that right away with with uh, Citadel and. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those that is very musically, I think, very un unconventional as well. But it, it works great. Like I don't, I don't know of another song that sounds like this. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't name one at all. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's really interesting in their catalog, and it's just a, a cool rock song. Yeah, and I. I know you to be a harpsichord fan, so with that, we'll yeah. we'll move on to uh, track three in another land. That's right. If you like harpsichord, um, you know uh, harpsichordenthusiast.com. Visit <laughs> that site, <laughs> like I do. Uh, then you I, probably I harp, know I harp, harpsichord.com. Yeah, that's copyrighted. So <laughs> watch yourself. <laughs> uh, so in another land is totally your your uh, your tune if you're if you like your uh, harpsichord on psychedelic rock albums. And this one has a, a really fun backstory to it about Bill Wyman. Do you want to, do you want to take that? Uh, well, as far as why he was doing the vocal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it, 
I don't know. As far as I know, it's a bit what you talked about already. And and by the way, the vocal is interesting in itself. With the uh, like, it's it's as if Bill Wyman recorded this underwater. Yeah, it's uh, like either uh, I think it's like a tremolo effect or vibrato. Yeah, well, so I I think he did the vocal because um it because Mick and Keith might have been in in jail at that time, right? From what I understand, uh, he shows up and the the session was uh canceled but no one told him no one got around oh, okay. telling him and so uh there's only one other person there maybe um the harpsichord player i think it might have been uh nikki hopkins uh but don't don't quote me on that but uh one of their kind of session guys that shows up so i think it's just bill wyman and some session guys that they're like, well, we've got this studio, we've got the time, um, and this is one of only, uh, I guess, three tunes that Bill Wyman writes for the Rolling Stones, and I'm not even sure that he sings the other two, but he he takes the lead vocals on this one, which is really unusual. Yeah, it it, really good. Well, yeah, it is the only time that he did the vocal, and and by the way, if it was Nicky Hopkins, then I was right. It was the harpsichord player because he yeah. Nick Nicky Hopkins played uh, harpsichord. Um, so yeah, it, it might've just been how that worked out. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's the only, uh, I'm pretty sure anyway, it's the only, uh, Bill Wyman vocal on a, a Rolling Stones album. So Lead in vocal. my, in my mind, how this plays out is that he shows up, no one's there except for, let's say it's Nicky Hopkins. And, uh, the only other thing in the studio is Mick Jagger's wizard hat from the, uh, <laughs> from the front cover for photography. So this is definitely the kind of tune that you write while you're wearing a wizard hat. Yeah. And, uh, and then, it, uh, <laughs> the snoring takes it out. A lot of, uh, interesting little musical or sound interludes. I guess snoring isn't necessary. Snoring is kind of musical depending, depending on how that goes. Depends, uh, depends on, on, uh, who, you know, yeah. but the big snoring outro and then, uh, into 2000 man, which, I, I totally love. Um, so Charlie Watts ha- has these moments of subtle brilliance uh, throughout the Rolling Stones catalog, and and to me, this is one of the one of my favorite Charlie Watts moments. Just the the drumming. Um, you know, who who thinks to drum the way that Charlie Watts is drumming on this track? Yeah, I don't. It's really strange. You you hear it, and for me, at first, I always think like. Uh, it's like a, a mess up with the, the tape or something, you know, um, <laughs> right. is the, the, the snare should be on the downbeat, but it's on the, not even on the upbeat. It's, it's, um, it's a really unusual track. It's very, un- yeah, it's very unusual. And I, I don't know, it, it, Charlie Watts has these moments where, where he, uh, you know, just comes up a winner. Like you, you think that this can't work out, you know, what, what he's doing can't work out. And it, it just ends up being like the best, the best thing ever. And, uh, I, I don't know if the other moments that I'm thinking of, you know, are, are quite as unconventional as this. Like, I don't know if there's another Charlie Watts moment that is quite this unconventional. Uh, but, but they're just, there are all kinds of moments that it just doesn't seem like there's anybody other than Charlie Watts that would have done it that way. Um, you know, just, just like the way he drums on Beast of Burden is, is just so letter perfect. And I don't, I, you know, like, uh, it, it ends up, it ends up being songs that you can't really cover because nobody's going to duplicate what, what he did. Um, you know, because not, not that this is maybe the best example, but, uh, Kiss Kiss covered two thousand man. Uh, Ace Freely did. Uh, I, I guess you probably was basically an Ace Freely cover because I'm sure those guys weren't super cohesive at that point. But uh, but you know it, it doesn't doesn't have the magic because it uh, the drummer whoever the drummer was isn't going to do what Charlie Watts was doing. Right, and if you listen to it, you know you almost think that maybe it's in. Uh, you know, like a DJ Bone Break kind of uh, tempo where there's, you know, uh, DJ Bone Break from X, you know, frequently the songs will be like these kind of straightforward rockabilly punk songs. But then 
if you analyze the time signature, time signature, it's like a five four against four four polyrhythm or something, you know. Um, so to answer your uh, pretty much rhetorical question of who else would drum like this, the only other person I could think two two other drummers that I'm huge fans of. Um, the only other drummers that would drum like this would be DJ Bonebreak from X and Stuart Copeland from The Police. Mm -hmm. So you're really complex, but simple sounding uh, backing track to that. Yeah, which, you know, to me, Charlie Watts, definitely the, the secret weapon of the Rolling Stones. I think some people, you know, not a secret to everybody, but but definitely a secret. To most. <laughs> There's this little band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, point taken, though. Point taken. A really cool song, uh, 2000 Men. Um, I like that even though it's it's kind of like a, a Stones, like bluesy roadhouse kind of tune, it's still fitting within the, the kind of like sci-fi wizard motif a little bit. And so 2000 Men, 2000 Light, light Years From Home, <laughs> and then... 30th century man by Scott Walker. That's, well, yeah, that's the jumping connection. all the way. <laughs> that's jumping all the way into the future. Oh, yeah. Scott Walker wasn't messing around. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've already lived to see uh, what would have happened with the, with the Stone songs here. Yeah. And then... Oh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so 2000 Man. And then... I guess for some reason we have the reprise of singing this all together already. <laughs> it's like, yeah, for for we some just reason heard that song. Yeah, yeah, for some reason is definitely the right <laughs> response to that. So this, see, this is the sort of thing to me that that makes me wary of of experimental music, uh, because I I tend to think of things like this. Um, you know, this this to me is a lot like Revolution Nine, uh, more or less. Uh, it just, you know, like the worst offense to me definitely is that this takes up a lot of prime real estate here. Uh, they they could have done something useful, uh, but instead it it's just this sort of hodgepodgey, quasi rehearsal being recorded, and it goes on for eight minutes and thirty three seconds. <laughs> yeah, you know the real crime of that is, um, yeah. So from from uh, the perspective of someone that has recorded music to be put out on vinyl, uh, there are very specific uh, buckets. Of, you know, a side of a record has to be a certain uh, running time. It can't exceed it. And then if you um, go under, then you've got like a lumpy side A because your track was six minutes long when it could only be five minutes long. So, um, so it's, this kind of sounds to me like, um, the engineer answers them when they ask how much room do we have left on side A and, they're like, and the engineer is <laughs> like seven minutes and 58 seconds guys. And, um, yeah, so it, it doesn't really do a lot for me. Uh, I'm not sure why it's there. And, um, the thing that gets me a little bit emotional, uh, you, you you mentioned this track just briefly in passing, but um, the single for I think she's a rainbow is kind of like a, a triple A side. So the the forty five was uh, I think it's she's a rainbow, dandelion, and we love you. And both um, We Love You and Dandelion are really, really good tracks. And they were recorded during these sessions, but they weren't on here because they were repurposed as B-sides. They would have been really good on to close out side A or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. I mean, they could have really, they could have just thrown together anything and, and come up with something way better than than uh this the extended cut of the snoring from uh the outro <laughs> right uh, yeah yeah, that. <laughs> yeah i mean it's just uh it's miss it, again mystifying i guess because uh why why does this have to exist why does this have to take up space um yeah i 
I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's just it would be better to to have it uh, come out lumpy. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it ends on kind of a a jam that uh, doesn't need to be there. But uh, then you flip it to uh, side B, and it, it starts out really strong. Yeah, she's a rainbow, um, and and the single the single version doesn't have the uh, the little sound thing going on uh, as an intro. I I wish that was the way it was on the album too, because I think uh, the the intro that they have, you know, again they were going for something that sounded you know interesting the way that Sgt. Pepper's did. It really just kind of undercuts the song, though. I I think it would be a lot stronger just to hear that that piano part. Uh, bringing in tra- uh, side two of the album, uh, but but a great song. It's it's beautiful. It's it's the Stones at their absolutely most melodic. Um, and by the way, string arrangements uh, by John Paul Jones pre uh, Led Zeppelin. All right, yeah, he was uh, really busy. Um, he probably arranged this in between uh, Donovan sessions, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah Mellow Yellow and and whatnot same year yeah <clears throat> uh so yeah g- great work by john paul jones and and a great stone song um good job you know, john I, paul jones you you get a certificate <laughs> that's right <laughs> you did it again <laughs> okay but, yeah that's a so yeah she's a rainbow all-time cool um stone song and, and yeah you kind of hear some of the promise of what what a uh, a Stones psychedelic response to Sgt. Pepper could have been, you know, if if um, they put as much time into um, the other tunes as they, they did to like "She's a Rainbow" and uh, two thousand light years from home" and and uh, yeah, really really solid tune. Yeah, def- definitely one that you know for most bands this would be a staple of their live set but you know with with the stones it just kind of gets lost in the heap uh which is incredible um (laughs) that that's a testament to how how much great material they had but also they probably should have hung on to it too yeah i mean uh yeah to if you were to hear uh like bobby keys playing sax getting that cool horn line in on a live version of she's a rainbow that would that would have been great yeah, I, I guess we'll never know. Uh, track two on on side two is the lantern, and uh, I, I think this this one's one. I, I would call this a grower. I, I don't think I always appreciated how how good. I, I think this is a really good track too, and uh, a hint of things to come. I think like this <clears throat> this song would have sounded right at home on Beggar's Banquet as well. Totally, yeah. yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think a very easy track to overlook, but a really good one. Yeah, a really neat one. Um, and yeah, I, I totally agree with it. Could it could uh, be on beggars, both uh, Two Thousand Man and and uh, the Lantern could are really cool Roadhouse songs. That's kind of how I was. I think of them um, lyrically. Um, I I don't think I've really thought too much about the Lantern until uh, putting this show together. And it's pretty deep, and it kind of fits in with the the um, the themes of this record about um, asking someone who's recently died, like someone that is close to the narrator in in this tune, to uh, when it's time for Mick Jagger to die, which is not going to happen, by the way, ever, <laughs> um, to you know, like light the way for him. I thought that was a really interesting uh, kind of lyrical story in this tune. Yeah. So again, a Rolling Stones song that gets totally lost in, in uh, the catalog, but on, on most bands catalogs, this, this would be a standout track, but yeah, I mean, even, even I had uh, overlooked that one for many years, but, but you know, it caught up to me eventually. Uh, track three, Gomper. Uh, yeah, what's up with Gomper? What's that all about? I don't, so, so yeah, to me, this is another another sort of uh, 
let, let's look to the Beatles sort of thing. Uh, it's it has that that uh, Indian influence to it, uh, but it doesn't feel. You know, like with the Beatles and, and especially to George Harrison, that that influence was a big one. That was that was a really strong influence that was very important to them. Whereas the Rolling Stones, this is just sort of a passing, you know, let's try this and record it and then end up putting it on the album. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I This is another track that I don't really think needs to be there. I don't think it's a super uh, sincere um, sort of track. It's not a terrible track, though, either. Yeah, it, it's. Um, I guess I've heard people kind of speculate that it's a response to "Within You, Without You" mm-hmm. on Sgt. Pepper's, which, as as our listeners know, is uh, the George Harrison uh, tune influenced by uh, Indian classical music. Yeah, and and so I don't know. It doesn't seem like. I, I guess, you know, it isn't sitar that, that is being played here. It's Brian Jones playing a, a dulcimer. Yeah, I think he's holding it on the cover, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it. it I don't know. It, it, it just doesn't feel very... Uh, it, it, it seems like a throwaway, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, track four, 2,000 Light Years From Home, definitely, you know, like... It, so... As far as uh, being uh, what this album, like to me, it, this, this is a big track for the album. Um, if you're going to to uh, take one track out and say this is what this album is, I would I would take out 2000 Light Years From Home. Uh, it's, you know, it, it has it has that feeling that the the title might suggest, you know, like it has that dark quality to it. Uh, very eerie intro music and yeah, uh, the Mellotron. Yeah, and 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 just great movement, great movement to the song. Um, another track that that could have easily been a Rolling Stones mainstay if not for the bulk of, of material that they produced over the years. Right, and um, yeah, the the vibe is is really cool. Uh, Speaking, we're, we're talking a lot about keyboards and stuff uh, this week, um, and yeah, Mellotron is such an instru- interesting instrument because the uh, samples are on little tape loops. So you, you know, in this song, you can just like hear the tape warble, and uh, that's uh, Brian Jones on Mellotron. And this may be apocryphal, but from what I understand, this is like the last major contribution of brian jones to uh the rolling stones in the in the studio right yeah it, it would well yeah the album certainly was but yeah you mean the track specifically the track yeah 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 love this track um so so there is one more track but i i feel like i feel like this would have been the perfect um the perfect song to go out on it would have been, yeah, and and just to um, talk a little bit more about that, um, I think there's uh, kind of like this. Um, you know how in two thousand one, a space odyssey, it's just like a really lonely film. Mm-hmm. I think they they can really they really capture that in this tune, and and uh, I'm not sure what book i read it in um maybe in life by keith richards oh wait keith richards is uh typing something in the comments hold on yeah (laughs) yeah, it's in that one um that uh when he and mick get busted for uh pop and thrown in jail i think the i think keith is in for like three days and mick is in for one day and when he's in jail, he writes the beginning lyric for 2000 Light Years from Home because he's lonely. Mm. Yeah, so that that makes sense. Um, but yeah, the musically, though, like is, is where I think it especially stands out. It just. Uh, it, it does get that that's that that feeling and it, it yeah, it is very intentionally, I think, science fiction. Uh, and you know would have preceded uh, the the movie of 2001 uh, by a couple of years, 
uh, but but does does get that that feeling that that sort of uh, you know it, it's what uh, David Bowie later did with with Major Tom. Um, yeah, just that, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Really uh, cool track. Yeah. Why? Why it doesn't end the album? I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I think it again has a lot to do with Sergeant Peppers. Sergeant it, Peppers. Yeah. You got to have the you know. Thanks for coming out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you you have to have that, uh, and you have the song on with the show uh, as the show is ending. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it certainly doesn't. Oh. But but it certainly is anticlimactic coming out of uh, out of two thousand light years from home. It is, yeah. So I think this one gets panned for a reason, but I like it for how strange it is and and how. How, how much of an oddball album this is and and before we you know wrap up this show I, I want to talk about what an awesome flood of records came out in the year 1967 yeah um yeah that that isn't uh that isn't a year we've gone over yeah we we did go over 68 68 I I think was we we discovered was kind of uh the uh the weak meat you know like 68 was a good enough year but but between 67 and 69 like 67 and 69 were such big years for albums and i i suppose you know that that's part of the problem here for the stones is that it was such a strong year for music uh and maybe this didn't live up to everything else that was going on i think if you take out you know Take, there's there's definitely some some fat to be trimmed here uh and if you take the fat out you know like especially uh the reprise of of sing this all together uh and and then you you do away with the notion of having to have the uh, intro and outro songs to frame it so that you get away from that that sergeant peppers comparison like this, this could be a this could be considered, I think, a great album if 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 uh, if you do some of those things, you know, make those adjustments. Yeah, if you uh, cut those tracks and put "We Love You" and "Dandelion" in there. Um, if we're going to just go ahead and remix this, I would uh, slot in "Dandelion" to follow "2000 Man," and "We Love You" is such a cool way to end the record, right? Yeah, except. Except I, I really like two thousand. Like I think it's hard to come out of two thousand light years from home with maybe anything, but especially well, I, th- I, I think two thousand two thousand light years from home would be the like totally rocking opening side A track one for me. But that's just how I like the sequence records. Kind of like my new record with clairvoyance available now. <laughs> 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 Shops everywhere, uh, Richard. Uh, RichardShirk.bandcamp.com. <laughs> My telephone number. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. But um, but yeah, cool, cool batch of songs could use some work. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, 1967. Just without getting us too bogged down, because this could be an entire show. I'm going to run down the list, and you you can feel free to chip in anything that I I neglected. Uh, in no particular order, we have uh, the first album by The Doors. Uh, we have The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter by The Incredible String Band. We have Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by The Beatles. We have SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things. We have Piper at the Gates of Dawn by Pink Floyd. Gift from a Flower to a Garden by Donovan, as well as Mellow Yellow. Forever Changes by Love and... I think Velvet Underground and Nico. Is that 66 yeah. or 67? 67. And uh, Jimi Hendrix Experience, Are You Experienced? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the aforementioned Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Not my favorite Beatles album, but it was a pretty important album. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, by Beatles standards, it's not my favorite. But, but uh, you know, Beatles, Beatles standards are, are not the normal standards. This right? is a whole a whole other show. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, the Who Sell Out was also 1967. Yeah, I mean, the Who Sell Out, uh, you know, that's, that's fine. But, I mean, it's not 
it's not forever changes, you know. It's pretty good. I yeah, I I I think uh I think it holds its own. Forever changes is great. Uh who sell out is great. Uh, actually, Axis Bold is Love also in 1967. Jimi Hendrix came out with a couple of great albums in wow, 1967. that was a good year for music. Yep. Uh, what else? Let me see. Uh, There's Surreal- some other things. Yeah, Pillow. like Surrealistic Pillow came out that year. But the ones I'm li- I listed are like the classics, man. But yeah, it was just a really, really good year to be hanging out at, a, at your neighborhood record shop, which... I strongly suggest everyone do that once uh, we clear up this COVID thing. The next time you're in 1967, or make the sure. next time you're in 1967, just don't don't go, you know, buying stock. Just go to the record store. Just go to the record store. <laughs> yeah. So, so here, here's my hot take for 1967. Oh yes, please. Magical Mystery Tour, uh, which also came out in 1967, better. Better album, at least a better batch of songs, anyway, than than Sergeant Pepper's. I understand why it's not as important, but it, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, it's really good. But yeah, uh, just uh, Sergeant Sergeant Pepper's uh, doesn't make my Beatles top five. And that's I guess that's my hot take. I think the uh, I like Magical Mystery Tour a lot, but I think the at the time the film kind of kind of sours it a little bit you know yeah for for anybody that uh really is a true believer in that that beatles and stones rivalry they're really upset right now that we we started out talking about the rolling stones but we finished on the beatles yeah the comments are blowing up uh buffalo springfield again also in 1967 john wesley uh 67 Uh Yeah, these are like what you do if they're sold out of the other record. So in, in my, <laughs> for my personal taste, you know, it's like, oh, you don't have Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I guess I'll go home with this uh, Jefferson Airplane tune and, or track. And uh, yeah, some, it, yeah, something else by the Kinks. Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, Bee Gees first. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot. It. Yeah, Bee Gees first. I would definitely include in my my super my super list. Uh, Moby Grape uh what else i don't know we're, we might be running out, we're not running out of albums but we're running out of like the 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 huge ones yeah i mean there, there's some other ones i could name but they're kind of minor like i think uh anthem of the sun by the grateful dead is that year which is you know kind of fun but not not iconic but anyway let, let's wrap up our our stones talk um What's your what's your like? Uh, what's your your final word on on this album? There's Satanic Majesty's request. Oh, uh, also almost called Cosmic Christmas. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because there's a, a little hidden track at the end of. <laughs> if if you can make it all the way through, thing this sing this all together, uh, the reprise, then uh, you, you hear Cosmic Christmas, which is about uh, a thirty minute song. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, basically just to reiterate, if you, if you trim the fat, if you maybe put in the songs that you mentioned in place of, uh, the aforementioned many time reprise and yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's not that far from, from good to great. It's definitely a good album. It, I think could easily go from good to great with just a couple of adjustments. Yeah. You know, I think about the album that could have been, and I think the real moral is, you know, we're not going to tell you uh, to not do drugs, but just don't get caught. And, (laughs) (laughs) and, uh, and, you know, put in your time in the studio and uh, that's the moral of the, of this story. Yeah. I like how weird it is. And, and I think part of me just joking aside really likes that there were these opportunities for other, other voices to step in and, and to, uh, to get their, their tracks on the album. It's a weird one. Uh, it was a weird time in that band. Uh, and, uh, it's a, a cool reflection of where, where the stones were at the time. Like maybe not, 
really that together as as a group, but definitely doing stuff that was uh, really interesting even fifty however many years later. But of the peaks and valleys, definitely not the deepest of the valleys. <laughs> it could be worse. That's right. All right. Yeah. So yeah, it uh, that concludes, and and uh, next week uh, we will be going back into the. Uh, it will be going to 1973 with the assistance of the flux capacitor the way back and, machine and the, yeah the way back machine um and and uh discussing our, our favorite uh songs and albums from the year 1973 so uh join us then and as always thank you for listening to left of the dial it's been really fun Left of the Dial, uh, also LOTD Pod. Uh, so look us up wherever wherever you want to find podcasts. I'm sure we're there. And uh, look up our Spotify page. We don't have a playlist from this week's show per se, but we do have uh, a running uh, monthly playlist that we put songs into. So uh, that look it up, uh, LOTD Pod on, on Spotify.com. Thanks, Flick. And always, as always, it's been uh, really fun. Don't ever change. I don't you ever change. <laughs> okay, see you next time, buddy. See you next next week. <laughs> <laughs>